grace and peace to you on this day. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of angst out there. There's a variety of reasons for this. There is political angst, if you watch the news at all. Economic angst, even cultural angst. Seems like a lot of things are changing and changing fast. And I think people, a lot of us, feel a little helpless around those things. What are we supposed to do about that? How can we help? It's hard for us, especially in the church. We're supposed to be do-gooding people, right? And yet that same angst affects all of us, and we feel it, and the pressures of it. We're not quite sure about it. We wonder at times if it makes any difference at all. Do we make any difference at all? It goes beyond that in the life of the church. I'm part of a group on Facebook of pastors, about uh, 3,500 of us on this. And there are people that have great, insightful things to share and pose really good questions. But by and large, I would say the tone is angst. How do we do this now? We know the angst of our institutions in the church and beyond that seem to be waning or finding a different place in this culture as we resettle who we are and what that means. And it leaves us with a lot of questions. It leaves us with a lot of uncertainties. We have this amazing promise that we've been given, that the Son of God has come and dwelt among us, lived among us, revealed himself to us. We've been seeing that through all of these weeks of Epiphany, who he is, what impacts he had on people's lives, including our own. <coughs> that he goes to the cross for your life and mine, and it's risen from the dead, and we don't know what to do with that. I don't know why. Is it just because we're afraid? Is it because we're afraid of saying the wrong thing, or doing the wrong thing, or messing it up somehow, or making it worse? I, I don't know. But as I look at the disciples, especially in this story, I find good company with them, because I think a lot has not changed. They do exactly the same thing, and they're with Jesus. They don't know what to do either. They go up the mountain with Jesus, and he is transfigured before them. He is God in flesh made manifest, as we say. He is bright and shining. He is the light of the world. His robes so white, bleach can't even make them any white. And they don't know what to do about that. They're terrified. A little bit more than angst, I think. And so Peter, trying to be practical, uh, does what I think a lot of us do. What if we just bunker down right here as he's shaking his boots, I think? I mean, don't we do that? We're not sure quite what to do, so we bunker down together. I'm not a big fan of this day. I've never been a big fan of transfiguration. I think because it doesn't seem practical to me. What am I supposed to do with the glow in the dark Jesus? I don't know. Maybe I'll just bunker down too. I mean, it seems like Peter's got a pretty good idea. I have a friend. She's retired now. She, had a, she loved this day. She always said it was her favorite day of the church here. I never understood why until I asked her. And she invited me to take a second look at Jesus. Because Mark is doing something amazing in this story. As does Matthew and Luke who tell this story too. See, the disciples, they witness this in real time. You know, they are there on the mountain, and they see this amazing thing happen, and they don't know what to do. But we have the benefit of hindsight, as does Mark, as does Matthew and Luke, who tell this same story. Because it's a bit of a, a glimpse into the future, at least the way he wants us to see what's happening there. It's not just this amazing thing that happens, which it of course is. But it tells us a little bit about where this story is going. This is about seeing the glory of Christ, the risen Christ, before he's gone to the cross. It's a preview, a glimpse, a flash forward. You know, we start Lent on Wednesday. And we have some practical things around Lent that all of us do that I think we can grab a hold of. I mean, a lot of us will give things up now. Okay? We do that. Or I'll take something new up to help me. Or I'll try to clear out the clutter in my life somehow. And that makes sense to us. We can do those things, or at least we can try. And as 
we go to the cross with Jesus, we understand that too, his humanity, his suffering, his death. I mean, maybe we don't fully get what that means, but we at least can see what it is. And yet we have this image of Jesus, dazzling white, the voice of the Father, these two figures, Moses and Elijah, the lawgiver and the prophet, and Jesus, and the voice of God. It's a flash forward. It's showing us where this story is going. So as we do these things, we know where we're headed to. That the cross and the resurrection are really two things put together into this moment, now. And we are a part of that. There was a TV show that was on a couple of years ago called Flash Forward. I don't know if you watched it. It's made by the same people that made Lost, which is my favorite show ever. And so I thought this is going to be fantastic. It starts with this uh, person, Joseph Fiennes, who's the lead character, and he wakes up uh, upside down in the car because he's blacked out. And uh, when he comes to, he climbs out of the car and he looks around and it appears that everybody else has experienced the same thing. There's lots of cars that are crashed. He was on the freeway. You see a helicopter fall out of the sky. You see smoke everywhere. You see people in pain. You see people that have died. And there's mass confusion, angst everywhere. Come to find out in a very short time that he's an FBI agent and he's been chasing the bad guys. And he has this partner who is with him. And they get the bad guys and they bring them back to their headquarters. And once they're there, you come to discover that everywhere in the world has experienced the same blackout for two minutes and 17 seconds. What does that mean? Who's responsible? And what does that look like now? Because people start sharing stories, too. They have these visions of the future, a lot of them. And you come to find out that they're all having visions of the same day, six months from then, in the future. There's one person, his partner, this Dimitri guy, who doesn't have the vision, so he assumes he's going to be killed. So he tries to work his whole next six months out trying to avoid that. There's a young woman who works in the office who's single and sees this uh, vision of the future where she's getting an ultrasound done because she's going to have a baby girl. She doesn't know what that's about. There's this person who's ready to uh, kill himself at the most darkest point of despair and has this vision of sitting with this young woman in a restaurant and he's joyful and it totally changes his life. He's not afraid of anything anymore. His depression leaves and he spends his time trying to find this person. There's one person uh, who's the friend, the good friend of Joseph Fiennes, who uh, had a daughter who was supposedly killed in the war in Afghanistan, and he sees her in this camp and his vision of the future. And so he spends his time trying to get there to rescue her. And then there is Joseph Fiennes, this lead character. He's put in charge of the project of the investigation to figure out what's going on and why. His vision of the future is kind of interesting. He has this big wall full of clues that are all hung all over the place with arrows and drawings and words. And his heart is racing because he's, he's scared. He's terrified. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he writes down on a slip of paper as he sees in this vision, who else knows because he's, he's figured it out. And in this moment, you see three bad guys coming in with masks and guns because they're coming for him. And that's when his vision ends. And it's really interesting because he does something different than everybody else in the show. Some people try to avoid their future because they don't like what they see or they don't know what it is. And some people like their future so much that they're trying everything they can do not to lose it. He embraces it. He stops worrying about things. He stops doubting the decisions he's making or the places he's going or the people he's talking to because he believes it'll all lead to this place. And lo and behold, after each episode, he's got a few more things hung in exactly the right spots on this wall. And it came down to the final episode of that first season, and it's that night. And people are celebrating out in the streets, and people are having parties, and people are really nervous, all the emotions you can imagine, and he is sitting in his office, 
staring at this wall, and he figures it out, and he writes down, does anyone else know? And he looks up, and he sees the men coming for him, but he's not terrified. His heart's still racing, but he's got a certain confidence to him, an urge, a description as maybe Peter would say, it's good for us to be here. He knows this is the moment that his life has been leading to. And whatever happens to him, it really doesn't matter because it's all led to this. And so he faces the bad guys and he, as this you know, eloquent chase scene happened. And the show ends with him jumping out of the building as it explodes. Well, that's all that happens because it didn't get picked up for a second season. <laughs> But partly, I like that. Because we don't know what happens. Even though we have this vision of the future, we see this glimpse of the risen Christ. We know of that glory that comes, but we don't see it fully. And yet we're given an opportunity to enter into that. To be in a place that we know the end of the story before we get there. And the question is, what do we do with that? Do we try to change it? Try to grab it for ourselves? Do we try to not lose it with everything that we've got? Or do we embrace it somehow? And we join in those words. It's good for us to be here because we know this is where God has called us to. Here's what I want you to think about as we enter Lent is to read the resurrection story backwards. I mean, don't literally read it backwards, that might be. But think about it backwards. Easter is on its way. The risen Christ is close. He's coming. And yet here we are at the beginning of that story. How might that, that change the way we think about it? I mean, we all have all kinds of responsibilities and pressures and things we want to do, things we don't think we have time for. I mean, if we had a vision in some way that by Easter, all those things would happen. Why are we worrying about them? Maybe this is the place where we're supposed to be. We can read the East story of Easter backwards, the promise of Easter, the new life that we're given to stand among Jesus in his glory. Maybe the problems of this world don't have to be so big. I walked up stairs this week, and I was in one of the... Uh, Sunday school classrooms, and last week, since it was Valentine's Day, the kids made these hearts, and they had them on either side of the whiteboard, and I think they were doing a project, you know, how can we love our neighbor, and so there's all kinds of things written on these uh, hearts everywhere. There's work on world peace, feed the hungry, give medicine to those who need it, build shelter for the homeless, care for the earth, all these really great things, but just, doesn't that seem just so big? where we would start. If you and I are part of God's restoration project in the world, which I believe we are, being people of the resurrection, maybe we are exactly where we're supposed to be. Maybe the things that are before us don't have to be so big. Maybe we can focus and actually enjoy the work that we're doing and include those around us in it. If we read the story backwards, into this moment now. This moment that you and I are a part of here in this place where it's good for us to be. I propose we take a sabbatical from our anxiety to this day. What if we just put it on the shelf for a while? You know, we're going to put hallelujah away for a time. Let's put our anxiety on the shelf with it too. Let's live in a way where we don't have to be afraid. Where we don't have to worry about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. We just do and we just speak, and we just welcome others to join us. That is the place where it's good for us to be. We're being called into that journey now. So I propose we open the doors. We go out with <coughs> courage. We be exactly who we are. Because the risen Christ is on his way.